He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. All right. Hey, welcome, folks. It is episode 100 of the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. I'll be honest, Phil, I had no idea when, when I agreed to co-host with you that it would turn into this. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great experience. Um, I had no idea either, to be honest. Uh, I forget what the stats are, but I think the average podcast is like 10 or 12 episodes or something like that. Uh, that, um, so, you know, I think it's a great accomplishment that we've gotten to a hundred and it's just amazing to kind of think back and reflect, like we're going to do some today about all the, um, really the, you know, wonderful people that we've had a chance to connect with and connect our audience with. And, you know, I, when I would think about, you know, what if we get to episode a hundred or whatever, you know, your thought is always, oh, well, we're going to run out of stuff to talk about easy. Uh, but, yeah. you know, we already have a long list of, of uh, upcoming guests and waiting lists. And uh, so uh, it's really been a fun journey so far. And first and foremost, you know, I want to thank the audience that has been listening and, you know, the engagement and all the great feedback we get. Uh, just seeing, you know, the downloads keep going up and up and up. Uh, is really, um, you know, rewarding. And then uh, thank you, Jack, for, you know, being my co-host and producer and making this a reality. Um, couldn't have done it without you, certainly. So uh, it's great accomplishment. And I'm look for looking forward to the next thousand now. I hope you have the, I hope you have the next 10 years or so available. Uh, well, it, it's an honor. I'm, and I, I will, I'll confess, this is a highlight of my week. I always look forward to these, uh, these interviews because I always get to talk. To, I love talking to inter interesting people. And uh, you just keep bringing on interesting people to talk to. So I went back and I looked through our, uh, our list of guests. And I just, I just made notes of some of the ones that that stuck out to me. And I wanted to ask you about, remember Stephen Hussey, the uh, chiropractor who yep. got into the heart. He was a type one diabetic, realized it put him at risk for heart disease, got real serious about learning heart, and blew my mind. Um, so in our conversation, you, he mentioned something about uh, how the heart creates a vortex and that it really doesn't have enough pumping power to pump blood through the entire length of the body, all the, all the, the arteries and veins, that there's something else going on. And you mentioned during that conversation that it was kind of an open secret amongst heart surgeons that, that, <laughs> whatever we thought the heart was doing wasn't exactly right. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So, you know, I think there's still a lot we don't understand about the heart. Uh, I mean, you know, the human body in general, uh, but the heart is still, you know, very, I would say, uh, misunderstood. And some of the things that we uh, believed about it, you know, we now know not to be true. And it continues to fascinate me, you know, some of the concepts that Stephen uh, talks about, uh, you know, between the actual sort of mechanics of the heart itself and the uh, fought fourth phase of water. Um, and the more and more we kind of look into this and I learn about it and others, you know, experiment around it, the more and more we seem you know, that there is validity to uh, these concepts. Um, you know, I think about, uh, well, I think about some of the things that I never used to think about, I guess is a good way to say it. And, you know, you look at um, uh, animal hearts, 
uh, and some of the variety across the animal kingdom. And, uh, you know, one of the things that particularly interests me, and I forget if I kind of started thinking about this because of Stephen or because of someone else, uh, but, you know, you look at a giraffe and uh, you look at the size of its heart and you think about the challenge it has of pumping, of, of getting blood up to a giraffe's brain uh, at that height. And, you know, the size of the giraffe heart, uh, again, doesn't seem to correlate to a pump strong enough to do that, you know, and you, you, you know, when you contrast it to, for instance, our human heart, which, you know, the maximum distance that the human heart has to pump uh, is actually down to the feet, you know, that's going to be the furthest part point away from the heart. And that's working with gravity, essentially. Uh, and the giraffe, you know, needs to go roughly four times that length against gravity. Uh, and, you know, but the heart, the giraffe heart isn't, you know, uh, I think the physics would predict that, uh, you know, I think it's a squared uh, equation or something, or even maybe a cubed equation. So you would need to be like 16 times the size of the human heart, which it clearly isn't. So um, more and more, I find myself, you know, while I'm in the operating room, just kind of looking at the heart differently and, and, you know, realizing that as Stephen, you know, brought up, you know, it doesn't really squeeze um, linearly like we talk about. It does corkscrew. Uh, and that's that vortexing effect that he was uh, talking about. Uh, and, you know, again, as heart surgeons, this is something we look at every day, we see every day, but we don't really think about it, um, you know. And uh, now I find myself thinking about things like that a lot more often. And like you said, that's because of all these interesting conversations that we've been having. So that's Stephen Hussey in the fourth phase of water. That was great stuff. And, you know, we had a steak and butter game on either right before or right after Stephen. I went back and I read the transcript of uh, the conversation we had with her. Wow. What a story that girl has. Yeah, yeah. You know, her story of going from, you know, vegan to carnivore, uh, literally in a day, you know, on the flip of a switch, essentially, and the changes that she experienced with that, uh, her perspective on the carnivore diet, you know, and she certainly has a, a unique style of carnivore, I would say, that is suited <laughs> to her particular uh, you know, her particular needs and physiology. Uh, but, you know, uh, great conversation. Um, I was very fortunate, you know, uh, after we had recorded that podcast, uh, you know, to spend some time with her um, filming the uh, Carnivore uh, Reverse TV series uh, and talking to her more and learning more about, even more about her story. Uh, very, very interesting uh, conversations. Uh, so another great guest that we had, you know, when I was, uh, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about this as if it's in the past tense. Um, as I am trying to maintain a state of ketosis, I occasionally think about Bella, the steak and butter gal, uh, uh, taking a, a stick of frozen butter with her to class <laughs> and Honestly, it sounds pretty good sometimes. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like I said, I was able to witness it in person, uh, her uh, just kind of chowing down on a stick of butter. And again, that's not the right answer for everyone, uh, but, uh, you know, it just kind of shows us when we drop our preconceived notions and uh, these ideas that, you know, uh, have been ingrained in us, um, you know, uh, uh, the, these sort of um, limiting truths, uh, limiting beliefs, uh, and you just, you know, really listen to your body and find what your body is craving yeah. and what your body needs, uh, you know, what you can accomplish when you do that. Well, and talking about her makes me think of uh, Nina Teichel's um, with her, the big fat, what was it? The big fat surprise, the name of yep. her book. Mm -hmm. Um Wow. Um, you know, I, I, after a year of, of working with you, I, I was aware that fat was important, but Nina put it in a, 
she reframed it. Uh, I, I, I had no idea that fat, that fat was as important as it is to the health of human beings. And it's, it, it's no surprise that uh, people who are trying to avoid fat end up with all kinds of other weird problems. Yeah, so, you know, Nina remains a uh, true uh, powerhouse uh, in the metabolic health world. Uh, again, you know, I've been real fortunate to uh, be able to work with her on some things and, and get to know her better. Uh, and it's really just, you know, when I look at the, you know, the people who are in this space that, you know, might not have that obvious connection to it. You know, they're not healthcare professionals. Uh, you know, they're not dealing with sick people necessarily, uh, but they, they, you know, get into it and they're passionate about it, um, whether it's because of their, you know, own uh, stories and own journeys, or just, you know, like Nina, you know, just has such a passion for it and has put such monumental efforts in her skills as a journalist, you know, and, and as we talked about on that episode, you know, she is what a true journalist is supposed to be, which is so rare these days. And just seeing her continue to take on the challenges uh, that she does, um, you know, continuing. Once again, she's, you know, in the midst of trying to influence the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee, um, as they enter sort of, or, or as they're in the middle of their next cycle, and uh, just really, you know, fighting the good fight. And uh, it was a real honor to be able to talk to her. There are three people that I, when I tell people about this, uh, this podcast, there's three doctors I always bring up. Uh, Thomas Seafried, Chris Palmer and William Davis. Um, those three guys, just just the things that I heard from them um, convinced me as if I needed convincing, but but they kind of put the the nail in the coffin that this is the right way for me to eat. Um, Chris, with his work in mental health, um, I've told lots of people about his book, Brain Energy. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting that you, you know, looking at those three and, and certainly many of the others that we've had on and realizing how they come at it, you know, they all came at it from different angles and different specialties uh, and yet arrive at the same place. And, you know, again, that's one of the things that continues to, um, surprise me, you know, in the metabolic health space. And as I'm at the conferences now, uh, and just seeing all the different doctors from all the different specialties, uh, who, you know, whether they start with observing unsolved problems in their patients, or as we've heard from so many doctors on this, uh, program, they had their own health challenges, uh, that started them down the pathway and they end up at the same conclusions in the same place. And, you know, that's what I think, uh, it, it is the best proof of what we're talking about. Uh, you know, the low fat diet, the U S dietary guidelines, um, those have to be kind of forced on people, you know, people don't intuitively come to that, uh, you know, carnivore, low carb, metabolic health, the concepts that we've been talking about. So many physicians, so many non-physicians, you know, have intuitively sort of found their way to that place. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of reinforces it for me that this, you know, is the right path. Uh, just seeing how all the different uh, specialties of medicine they all come back to the same place. Well, I, I want to just highlight a couple of things that that are from those guys. Thomas Seafried said, all cancer is a metabolic disease. 
Chris Palmer said, all brain dysfunction is metabolic dysfunction. And William Davis, he changed the way we eat almost immediately. Um, my wife uh, listened to the podcast and immediately went out and, and started making uh, our own homemade yogurt. Uh, and we've been we've been eating that yogurt now for what? It's been well over a year. Um, I remember Dr. Davis said, when you start eating this yogurt, it might affect your dreams. You'll have vivid dreams. He was right. <laughs> oh, remember Nayiri Masissian, our type yes. 1 diabetic? Yes. She really impressed me. And this is a woman who's not a healthcare professional. She's, uh, what is it? I think she does uh, uh, translation. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of, I guess, her main job, you would say, is her translation work. But uh, this is a woman with type 1 diabetes who's who said, you know what? I'm not going to let it stop me. And I mean, it's it's kind of a broken record, but guess, guess what the solution is? High fat, low carb diet. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, we recently just a few weeks ago had uh, Dr. Kutnick on, uh, you know, yeah. who's done you know, doing the research and coming to those same conclusions uh, that Neary and, and many others, you know, again, have been able to come at, uh, you know, been able to arrive at uh, on their own as well. So um, again, you know, uh, it, it, it continues, you know, type diabetes in general, uh, you know, is close uh, to me. I have family members and certainly most of my patients, many of my patients, um, you know, on the heart surgery side of things uh, have diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, you know, but looking at type, you know, and, and I think it's very well accepted uh, at this point, um, you know, still minority, but well accepted that type two diabetes can be improved with um, low carb diets. Uh, but, you know, the, the pioneering kind of spirit of managing your type one diabetes with low carb uh, is, uh, again, very um, inspiring uh, to see uh, what people like Nairi have been able to accomplish uh, when they've, like I said, kind of forgotten uh, or chose to ignore the preconceived notions and the limiting beliefs, and they're just accomplishing amazing things. It is, it's kind of wacky that here we are a hundred episodes in and we keep talking about the same thing. We talk about it from a, a hundred different directions, but it all boils down to pretty much the same thing. It's ugh. Brian Linskis. He was our first, I think he was our very first guest. And I got such a kick out of his story. Um, I've told it over and over again. He gets on the phone with his uh, his insurance rep and says, hey, if you'll let me spend more time with my patients, I can save you some money on, uh, on medication because I'm helping them get off the medication. And the healthcare rep said, you're not saving us money, you're costing money. And that was when he decided he was going to go into direct primary care. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, real fortunate to uh, count Brian as a as a close uh, colleague and friend. And, you know, as we mentioned during the episode, he was certainly one of the ones that guided me through my transition, um, you know, in uh, uh, and adding, you know, the additional aspects to my professional life that I have um, opening, you know, my private practice. Uh, so um, and Brian continues, you know, he's such He's just such a great ambassador because he's such a great guy, um, you know, so easygoing. And, uh, you know, sometimes in this space, uh, we tend to get sucked into the, you know, the the um, kind of battles, the, you know, fighting with people online. And, uh, you know, Brian just has such a great ability to kind of step back and 
you know, bring in a little bit of a sense of humor and just, you know, kind of be like, relax, guys. Like, you know, we're just trying to help people. And, um, you know, he's doing such great work, uh, continues on his uh, journey. He's now actually expanded his practice to a second state and uh, anyway. you know, really, really good to see. Yeah, he's actually uh, uh, he's actually in Arizona now. So um, oh. you might want to connect with him, Jack. Uh, you may need to do that. Exactly. But uh, yeah, like I said, real uh, um, Brian's one of the people that I truly value, uh, you know, his uh, his collegiality and his uh, guidance as uh, I've been going through this journey. Nick Norwitz, man, I mean, we've, we've met some, some impressive people. That kid blew my mind. I would love to, to continue to follow up with Nick Norwitz. Um, I can't remember. Was he, was he still in his medical program? Yeah. So uh, Nick is still in medical school, you know, uh, after have having completed his PhD, uh, you know, he, he continues to be my inspiration for the future and, um, why I think we're, we're all going to be all right, because, uh, you know, he, he, doctors like him that are, are just starting, just getting started. And, you know, he's had such a great influence on, you know, his classmates, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, seeing him, um, the, the, the papers he's been publishing in the scientific literature already, uh, on these topics and, you know, the talks that he gives, uh, now at conferences and, uh, you know, he's one of those guys who's able to really get out there and on the scientific front, you know, do the stuff that needs to be done. Uh, you know, it's great that we all have these success stories. And, you know, I see my patient's successes all the time. And, you know, those are really evidence enough for me. Uh, but the reality is, is that we need that scientific evidence. We need that those rigorous studies. Uh, and, you know, Nick is one of the people who's doing it and is going to be doing it well into the future uh, that can continue to uh, lead us um, as we try and, you know, I guess, uh, make others realize the legitimacy of what we're doing. We know it's legitimate, but, you know, you have to be able to prove it to others. And yeah. uh, Nick is a huge part of that. Um, he's got it. He had his whole class wearing CGMs. Is that right? Yep. Yep. They, mm -hmm. and, and they uh, published, uh, they, they actually ended up publishing a, uh, a study on that experience. Uh, so one of the, you know, contributions that he's already made to the medical uh, literature. Oh, wow. Well, you got to figure that class of physicians is, is going to be noteworthy, just simply because of that experience. I sure hope so. And, you know, it's kind of ironic, uh, you know, for me, uh, because, you know, he's at Harvard Medical School, uh, and Harvard has been the source of such of such uh, so much of the contrary, uh, you know, information uh, that's out there, and so it's kind of uh, you know it, it it's a little bit of sort of the Trojan horse, you know, coming from the inside there, uh, which really uh, you know I love seeing. And uh, yeah, I, I, I very much believe that it's not just going to be Nick, but many of his classmates who, you know, uh, are going to be the leaders of this uh, space um, well into the future. We need to make sure we get Nick back on at some point. Just, Definitely. Just, what, just catch us up, Nick. What, what, what amazing things are you doing now? Um. You know, one of the ones that I found, well, I, I'm I'm all, I'm fascinated by all these people, but uh, Bitten Johnson, that was something, the 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 link between metabolic health and addiction, that was something I did not see coming. Um, that looks to me like a field ripe for lots 
and lots of research, lots of study. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, uh, Bidden's been a pioneer in this space. Uh, there are a few others, um, you know, that I can think of, some of which uh, I think we may have one upcoming guest uh, who's uh, in similar uh, space, uh, and we'll be able to talk to that as well. But, you know, we need to, again, acknowledge uh, that um, much like, you know, alcohol or drug addiction, uh, some of these foods are truly addictive. Uh, and the approach to changing our habits around that need to take that into account. Uh, and, you know, again, it's something I see over and over again in my, in my patients that, you know, there are just some of those people that, you know, they believe, you know, what needs to be done. They know what needs to be done. And yet they still find themselves not able to uh, do it and not able to stick to it uh, in very similar patterns that we see in, you know, uh, drug addicts, alcohol addiction, cigarette addiction, whatever you want to look at, uh, whatever addictive behavior. So uh, I think it is a very important concept uh, that needs to be uh, continued to uh, studied and explored. So for those of you who are listening and maybe didn't hear that episode, Bitten Johnson uh, is an addiction expert, and she connects the dots between addiction and metabolic health, or more, more accurately, metabolic ill health. Uh, I got a kick out of Vinnie Tortorich. Um, that just seemed like a dude to be fun to hang out with, uh, aside from the fact that he's fanatically fit. Um, that was a good, that was a good interview. I'm glad you, I'm glad you, you got him. Yeah. So, uh, I've been fortunate to be able to just hang out with Vinny and you're right. He is, uh, you know, very fun to hang out with. Um, and again, he's been, uh, you know, he's been talking about this stuff, uh, for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, he was one of the early voices, uh, his podcast, you know, you talk about us here celebrating, you know, a hundred episodes, which is amazing. Uh, and then, you know, Vinny's up to like 2,500 episodes or something. I, certainly I, I can't keep track, but it's, uh, you know, even more, uh, you know, he's just out there doing it and, uh, has been doing it for quite a long time. And, uh, you know, ha has been called crazy by many, uh, many people. Uh, but, you know, uh, as time passes, he looks more and more correct uh, every day. And, uh, you know, as Vinny says, you know, uh, and this is a quote from him, so uh, people hopefully won't uh, perceive it as me disparaging him in any way. He's like, if some idiot from the bayou can figure this out, you know, why can't all of these doctors? And that's just, you know, one of my favorite uh, quotes from him. So, uh, yeah. and he's great. And uh, he's another one that certainly, um, you know, we'll, we'll circle back with at some point. A couple that uh, I made note of in the same category are Siobhan Huggins and Dave Feldman, a couple of citizen scientists who have made significant contributions to to the field from uh from the, the same kind of chair I sit in just just a guy and a gal who got interested in it and uh and and are making a difference yeah you know kind of a dynamic duo uh you know they've been working uh alongside each other now for a number of years uh Siobhan uh you know, again, really amazing. And she's someone that it's been kind of such a uh, joy to watch her uh, growth uh, over the past few years. You know, I uh, uh, recently uh, had a family friend uh, who um, has lipedema, you know, what uh, the condition, the very unrecognized, undiagnosed and misunderstood condition that Siobhan has now focused on and, uh, you know, immediately pointed her to that episode of our podcast and, and Siobhan's other work. And, um, 
you know, it, it was very helpful uh, to our friend. Uh, but I was kind of reflecting uh, because the friend had mentioned, you know, she watched our episode on YouTube and was like, wow, you know, she she looks really young. And uh, I said, yeah, she is really young. And, and, you know, she's one of the people that I think back to like the first, you know, metabolic health conference that I went to. And uh, when I first met her and, you know, uh, and now over the past six or seven years, you know, uh, maybe because she's so young, it seems like, you know, you've seen that maturity and that uh, how, you know, uh, she's really come into her own uh, place and is now a, a prominent speaker at many of the conferences. So I really uh, enjoy um, working with her. And Dave, Dave's just amazing. Dave's great. Um, you know, I, I, again, someone that I really count as a colleague and a friend. Uh, people may have noticed on Twitter uh, the other day, I'd sent out a tweet uh, because Dave uh, sent me, and unfortunately I don't have it with me here, it's uh, back home, but it's a uh, hand uh, crocheted uh, model of a lipoprotein that Dave's mom made uh, that um, is one of my uh, favorite possessions that, you know, he sent me a while back. So uh, again, Dave's, and Dave's another one who uh, doesn't need to be doing what he's doing, you know, certainly isn't his uh, wasn't, you know, really his, uh, uh, his field of expertise, you know, or anything, but, you know, because of his own, uh, journey, he got into it more and more. And now he's out there leading again, these scientific studies that are going to help us to continue, uh, to validate the, the things that we're doing. I get a kick out of the fact that it's, that it's a couple of, of, uh, non healthcare professionals who are leading the charge here with the research. Um, and, and this doesn't have anything to do with metabolic health. It's just an observation that oftentimes the breakthroughs in any scientific endeavor come from people outside the field. And I guess it's, I guess for some reason they're, they're, they've got a, a more flexible mental model than people who have uh, been disciplined in the work of the field. And it's, yeah, it's those, really cool to see that. Yeah, those limiting beliefs that, you know, we talk about. And I think back about, you know, all of the sort of limiting beliefs that were ingrained in me throughout, you know, the educational process to become a doctor and, and become a heart surgeon. And um, it's great to be able to see guys like Dave who don't come with those preconceived notions. Uh, they just go where the evidence leads them. And again, they end up at these places. Uh, so it's, uh, it's that sort of intuitive, uh, tract again, uh, that just, I, I think that's really the best evidence, uh, for what we're doing is seeing, uh, really smart guys like Dave who think about really complex problems in different ways, uh, than, you know, most doctors do and seeing that he comes to the same conclusions uh, that, you know, a doctor like myself, you know, came to um, independently. Uh, and that, you know, that really is, uh, I think, the best definition of truth that we have is when, you know, people are able to come to the same conclusions, starting from different points, and having different uh, sort of um, environments to work in or mindsets, uh, you know, that they work with then. He's another one I'm looking forward to to following up with. Let's yeah, we'll see. definitely have him back as he, uh, you know, as the research that he's doing finalizes and starts to produce results. Uh, I'm really looking forward to um, having him back on once those results are out. The last one I made a note of was was uh, Virgie B. Ellington, and this is personal for me because. As you know, I had a health issue uh, a year ago, and after we stopped the recording with Dr. Ellington, I just mentioned to her what I was dealing with, and over the next several weeks, she made a point of following up with me and telling me, you know, asked me to send her stuff and, and uh, looked at it and said, okay, here's what this is, and here's what you need to do, and here's what happened, and... um. 
that woman is a gift from God. I just, wow, I was, I, I'm, I'm so glad she came along. Um, she informed me that my HIPAA rights had been violated, by the way. <laughs> not, not surprising, unfortunately, knowing what I know and seeing how the system works. But yeah, Virgie is great. Um, you know, again, not necessarily, you know, it was a little bit of a different conversation than we've typically had. It wasn't really, you know, centered on the metabolic health, although a lot of it was about the failings of our medical system. And, uh, you know, it, it just, one of the things that um, I love so much is these random connections that now, you know, come to me, uh, whether, you know, it's social media or, you know, friend of a friend of, you know, you got to talk to this person uh, and, you know, continuing to build out that network of uh, contacts and, and uh, Virgie is a great part of that. And yeah, I've now pointed a, a couple of other people her way as well uh, for those reasons. Well, those are the, those are the, the notables on my list. Who do, who do you have that uh, I didn't know it? Yeah, well, you know, one that I, I just uh, want to really mention is, is, is trochalasian. And again, you know, we talked about Brian Lenskis early, you know, earlier, and tro was the other, you know, kind of guiding force for me as I figured out how to integrate this into my professional life. Uh, so it, uh, you know, he's one other that I wanted to uh, certainly mention. Uh, so many others, you know, I think about some of the you know, again, the non-practitioners uh, that are in this space and, uh, you know, a guy like um, Ed Lattimore, uh, who we had such a great conversation with, um, uh, Ryan Muncy, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. we had that great conversation about mastering your mind and uh, your emotions. Um uh, there, there, you know, it just, I love having those conversations. It's great. You know, the contrast, uh, in our conversations when, you know, we have the other practitioners on and we can get, you know, deep in the woods about some of the, uh, scientific stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes you even have to back us off and, and, uh, you know, simplify things. But then when we can talk to the non-practitioners, uh, another great one was uh, Eric Reynolds, the uh, ex-cop, uh, you know, and all the uh, work that he's been doing now uh, to continue to uh, promote this message uh, and his message of helping uh, our, uh, you know, uh, first responders. Um, so that's been so enjoyable to me as well as just uh, talking with some of the non-practitioners. And uh, really, you know, it, it, you know, as I'm scrolling through the list of all the episodes, uh, here we are 100 episodes in, and I think about 80 of those have had guests. And, you know, the first 20 were just you and I kind of talking about concepts. Uh, but really, um, I struggle to find one that I don't, it, you know, don't think was amazing and didn't enjoy. And like you said, it, it really has been such an honor. Uh, to talk to all the great people that we've been able to talk to and really looking forward to the next 100 and beyond, uh, you know, even looking at our calendar, which is now, you know, 10 or 12 episodes uh, booked out uh, and seeing who's coming up, uh, really excited for uh, those conversations as well. Well, it's been a good ride so far. And uh... Here's to at least the next hundred. Looking forward to it with you, Jack. All righty. Y'all join us. A new one drops every Tuesday at midnight. I think midnight. Midnight on Tuesday. Tuesday. Subscribe. You'll get it. Exactly. We'll talk to Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Avadia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.